Well, good morning, First Family. What a joy it is to be with you today. If you're glad to be here, say amen. amen. I'm glad you made it through the construction zone. Amen to that too. Praise the Lord for these work that's going on outside our doors. Would you pray with me for those who are working? Would you pray for their safety? Will you pray for God's provision for their family? Will you pray for patience for all of us who are managing around it? And will you pray that God will make it as short as possible from now until it's finished? Praise the Lord that they're doing their work. Hey, let's pray this morning for our friends that are headed out to Honduras. Yesterday, you may not know it, but yesterday we sent a team down to Honduras. They've gone with a mission to share Jesus by drilling water wells. Now, we know something about drilling here, don't we? Water is what they're drilling for this time. Our friend John Elliott, our activities minister, is down there leading the team. I want us to take a moment and pray for them, for God's protection over them. Let's do that right now. God, we thank you that we get to be on mission, that you love us so much. Not only are you willing to give us new life, but you send us out to share it with others. Lord, we've sent a team down to Honduras, a, t- a team with, with two purposes, bring the good news of your gospel, but also to drill for water. I pray, God, for your faithfulness to guard them, protect them, guard their steps, And thank you, Lord Jesus, for their willingness to go. I pray that your blessings would be upon them, that the wells they drill hit, and that, God, you would bring fresh water, living water, both through that well and through their words. We know, Lord Jesus, that you've called us to be in partnership with you, and so, Jesus, we choose that today. Thank you for these who have gone. Bless them, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm also pleased to tell you we have a very special guest coming two weeks from today. We have a friend who is coming to be our associate children's minister. No, our friend Sarah Aaron Booty, our children's minister, is not going anywhere. We're adding to her staff. We have a candidate that we want to bring in view of a call two weeks from today. Now, as is our custom, we won't tell you who they are until they actually arrive. But I want to tell you, friends, I think you'll be pleased. I think you'll be excited. Uh, I've met with her a couple of times now, a remarkable lady. She is ready to serve the Lord here. She's been serving the Lord. This is an exciting opportunity. Two weeks from today, you'll get a chance to meet her, hear from her. And on uh, Saturday, uh, the day before that, you'll get a chance to come to a question and answer time and talk with her, meet with her, meet with her family. I want to encourage you, be here to be celebrating that special day. Hey, open your Bible. Let's turn back to Jeremiah chapter 6. We're continuing our series uh, in the book of Jeremiah, and we're at the crossroads. This chapter is sort of central to the mission and the message that our friend Jeremiah has. Crossroads. They come to us all the time and in a lot of different ways. Here's a great example. A couple of weeks ago, I took my son and I went to the barber shop. We went to get haircuts, and, and uh, you know, we went to get the haircut, and I sat down in this, this lady's chair, and I said jokingly, hey, how about this? Just cut out all the gray and leave the brown behind. And she said, well, if I do that, there won't be anything left. I'm at a crossroads right there, all right? A crossroads. Do I raise up and smack this woman on top of the head like she deserves it? Do I not give her a tip? Because after all, her whole mission is to get me to tip something, right? Or do I just brush it off? Well, I played it out in my mind right fast, and I thought about the headline that would be in the MRT later in that same week. Local pastor beats up cosmetologist. Uh, I didn't think that would go well for me, so we let that pass. The crossroads changed. Can I tell you, friends, that might be a small one, but when we arrive in the story of Jeremiah, chapter 6, we find that it is not a small one. The message that our friend Jeremiah is charged with bringing is one of God's judgment. It's God's warning. Judgment is on the horizon. See it with me in the first three verses of Jeremiah chapter 6. Flee for safety, O people of Benjamin, from the midst of Jerusalem. Blow the trumpet in Tekoa and raise a signal on Beth Hakaram, for the disaster looms out of the north and great destruction The lovely and delicately bred I will destroy the daughter of Zion. Shepherds with their flocks will come against her. They shall pitch their tents around her. They shall pasture each in his place. 
This warning from God is a plea, a plea for a change of direction. You're at a crossroads, God is saying. You had a choice to make. But just over the horizon, just out of sight, just beyond what you can see, there's judgment waiting. Now, they'd seen this before. Let's remind ourselves of this. Just about 160 years earlier, the northern kingdom had fallen. They know God is not joking. They know this is not a ruse, that God means what he says. So when God says judgment is building on the north, he means it. He reinforces that with that statement. See it there in verse 1. Blow the trumpet into co. This is a call to action. This is a, a, a way for God to say, hey, wake up, friends. Wake up. Hear the sound of action. And let's do something about it. But you know, it's one thing to hear the call. It's another thing entirely to do something about it. The reality is their luxurious lifestyles were something they didn't want to change. Oh, yes, we know it's opposed to God's word. We know it's opposed to God's will. We know it's not in keeping with his covenant. But we're so comfortable. It's so easy. It's so pleasant here. Why would we risk that? God doesn't really mean it. He won't ever judge us. I want you to see the reality that we face here. See it in verse 2. The lovely and delicately bred I will destroy, the daughter of Zion. This phraseology might be a little unclear to you, but when you unpack it a little bit, it's clear to see that God is not reserving this for the wicked. It is for all of them. Let's talk about God's purpose for a minute. God's purpose for Israel was redemptive, not punitive. Like now, there are people then who were saying, but God is all love. He is only love. How could a good God, how could a loving God, how could a grace-filled God bring judgment on us? I want to pause here for a moment and say this. Our God is loving. Our God is grace-filled. Our God is incredibly patient. Our God is one who is redemptive at every turn. But our God is also holy. And God's holiness cannot be outstripped by his other character qualities. In other words, there comes a moment in time when our God must reconcile his holiness. For the people in Jeremiah's time, his word to them is, that time is now. I've let you run to the end of your leash and now it's time to draw you back. If the only way you'll respond to me is through judgment, correction, coming from the north, then I'm willing to do that. I want to give you a couple things to take home. Humility flows from seeing who God truly is. It's been said, and rightly so, that God made man in his image, and that man has been returning the favor ever since then. Meaning that we have shaped God into who we want him to be. Well, God thinks like I do. He hates who I hate and loves who I love. God thinks about things like I do. And so if I just maintain my thought pattern and my, my own path, then God will be good with me. Can I tell you, friends, humility recognizes who God is, not just who I want him to be. Let's the word of God speak for itself about his character, about his qualities, about who he really is. And when I see that, then humility is me responding to that and saying, God, I've been out of step with you. Let me correct myself. I've heard your warning. Now I'm ready to correct it. Here's the second thing to take home. God's corrective and redemptive warnings are ever-present, even now. Even now, what is the purpose of Jesus speaking so frequently in the Gospels about hell? It's because he doesn't want people to go there. He's pleading with them. Repent. Turn away from this broken path that you're on. 
Oh, friends, the sad reality is no matter how much passion we preach with, no matter how much passion Jesus poured out on the cross, no matter how much zealousness is exhibited by the followers, there will be some who will go to hell simply because they'd rather choose their own lives than be redemptive, than choose repentance. You see, eventually, eventually, God's patience runs out. For the nation in Jeremiah's day, it's just around the corner. For us, it may be sooner than that. Jesus' return is imminent. We know that. That's why God offers some instructions in verses 4 to 7. These are curious instructions, though. God's curious instructions there in verses 4 to 7. Here it is, I read it aloud. Prepare war against her. This is God speaking about his own people. Prepare war against her. Arise and let us attack at noon. Woe to us, for the day declines, for the shadows of evening lengthen. Arise and let us attack by night and destroy her palaces. For thus says the Lord of hosts, cut down her trees, cast up a siege mound against Jerusalem. This is the city that must be punished. There is nothing but oppression within her. As a well keeps its water fresh, so she keeps fresh her evil. Violence and destruction are heard within her. Sickness and wounds are ever before me. As a last resort, friends, God, to display his desire to correct his people, as a last resort, he says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to prepare for war against Israel. Now, I want to ask you, and this is a serious and honest question, do you think that it gives God any joy to do this? Because I don't. I don't think God wants to do this. I don't think he wants to send people to hell. I don't think it makes God happy in any stretch or in any sense to say, hey, yeah, I'm going to bring this judgment. I'm going to bring this catastrophe. I'm going to bring this destruction. I'm going to send people. I'm going to let them go to hell. But I don't think that's what God wants. I think what he wants instead is for them to turn. Uh, sure, the instructions are, prepare for war, but it's not what God wants. Let it stand as a symbol. There's a limit for what God's holiness can endure. The analogy of the length of the day points to the very patient God who's waited all day long into the evening hours now, just before dark. And now, finally, people have rejected him long enough. Chop down these trees. See it there in verse 6. Cut down her trees. Let's talk about military strategies in the 7th century B.C., shall we? This is a proper method for constructing war, for building a, an attack plan. The military strategies of that day were to chop down the trees so they'd have no resources with which to rebuild and use those trees as weapons against the land from which they were cut. Now, if you've not been with me to Israel yet, and yes, we are taking trips eventually whenever the war is over, then understand this. The area around Jerusalem and south of there, especially south, is a lot like us. Trees are a precious commodity. They are not as plentiful as they wish they were. And this is an opportunity for us to embrace and what God is saying here is catastrophic. Cut those trees down. Get this last part. Punishment is coming because evil is as common as fresh water, and she seems to like it that way. See it in verse 7. As a well keeps its water fresh, so she keeps fresh her evil. It's so common. It's so frequent. It's so regular that it's like fresh water. It's just available everywhere. Evil is something that she does because it's essentially, God's saying, who she is. Now, I want to give you just one thing to take home here. God's instructions to Jeremiah were curious, but obedient submission reflects our trust in God's sovereign wisdom. So let's say that God gives us some curious instructions and says, hey, here's what you're to do. Here's the path to go on. Here's the direction I want you to walk. Understand that God is asking us to trust him even if we don't understand the way. This is an element that we don't talk a lot about because we shouldn't have to, but it's important to talk about right now. 
God is sovereign, meaning he's in charge everywhere, always. His authority is in, in place whether we acknowledge and embrace it or not. And when we recognize that, then it makes it easy for us to obey. The problem that many of us have, and I'll include myself in that category, is this. I want to be in charge. And who better, right? I want to be in charge. God, this is what you need to do, and I'll tell you how and when to do it. Oh, friends, I don't know. I don't know what's best for me, and I sure don't know what's best for you. This is also where some people say, well, if judgment is coming, then I'll just stay out of the church because, after all, they're all broken institutions anyway. Yeah, I'll agree with that. If you find a perfect church, don't join it. You'll mess it up, all right? Don't take that personally. It's just a re reality that exists. But it leads us around to Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 8. God's solemn warning. See it in verse 8. Be warned, O Jerusalem, lest I turn from you in disgust, lest I invite you a desolation, an uninhabited land. See, this isn't what God wants, but clearly this is what the people are demanding. When you insist on being sovereign unto yourself, then eventually God will grant you that sovereignty and watch you drive straight into the ditch. See it in verse 9. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they shall glean thoroughly as a vine the remnant of Israel. Like a grape gatherer, pass your hand again over its branches. Let's talk about this. With a heart for his people, God warns them of their consequences. The warning could not be more clear. Turn now or find yourself decimated. The enemies, they're at the gates. They're about to pounce. And not only that, they are emissaries of God's judgment. In other words, God withdrew his hand from you because you demanded that he do so. And when God withdraws his hand, his protective hand, then it invites destruction upon you. Friends, this is not what God wants, then or now. Now you might say, well, prove it, Darren. Well, I'll do that right now. You see the cross behind me? The one right back there? I want you to see that cross. And I want you to understand this about what it means. It means that God poured out all of his wrath, all of his anger, all of his judgment on Jesus Christ himself. He paid that penalty for you so you wouldn't have to. Now here's where it breaks down. If you insist on paying that penalty instead of Jesus or with Jesus, then the wrath of God must fall on you. But it doesn't have to because Jesus paid it already. He paid that for you. If you're one who is hearing me say this and you're like, hey, God's wrath is coming from me. God is angry with me. I've done wrong things. I've said wrong things. I've been in wrong places. I got good news for you. God already knows all that. And he still says, come home. What if, what if the people of Israel had heard Jeremiah's word and they had turned. Would this book exist at all? Well, if it did, it would only be six chapters long. We'd end the series today, but you know, they didn't. They didn't. Instead, when they came to the T in the road, the people went straight. T in the road, not turning left, not turning right. They tried to forge their own path. Like the grapes in the vineyard that were talked about in verses 8 and 9, they believed that they were independent. And we don't have a lot of grape harvest in our part of the world. Maybe it bears a little explanation. When a harvester is going through a vineyard, bringing the grapes down that are ready to harvest, it is his practice to reach and take that grape, that cluster, and cut it at the top. Now, he has to look carefully, though, to make sure the grapes are ready because, get this, and this is the whole point, the grape's entire life source 
is connected to that vine. Whether the grapes know it or not, their whole life source is connected to that vine. Maybe the grapes don't know that. Maybe they want to insist on having their own sovereignty. Maybe they say, you know, if we could just be free of this vine, then we would be much better off. We would be able to make our own decisions. What they don't know is that cutting themselves off from the vine begins the death process already. Immediately, as soon as that is cut, they are disconnected from the life source. And according to the principles of biology and, and physiology in the world, death begins. I want to encourage you, friends, recognize this. God longs for you to turn to him. It is not easy, but it is necessary. I want you to see verse 13. For from the least of the greatest of these, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. And from the prophet to the peace, to the priest, everyone deals falsely. Oh, friends, what a terrible legacy. What a terrible thing for God to say about these people, these people that he loves, these people that he led through the wilderness, these people that he delivered to this land. Why would they be so hard-hearted? Well, it's because they have one thing that they shouldn't have, and they don't have something else that they should. They have false confidence. They lack shame. My friend Brandon read it so well. Let me read it one more time. They've healed the wound of my people lightly. In other words, they just made out like it was all good. They didn't actually bring any healing or a balm to it. They didn't solve the problem. They just changed the x-rays. They just changed the test results. Peace, peace, they said, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they committed these abominations? No, they were not at all ashamed. Get this. Right there in the middle of verse 15. They did not know how to blush. Oh my goodness. They had lost the sense of the holy, of the divine. They lacked shame. Shame can be a healthy and appropriate tool when used in the right hands. Satan likes to use it and to twist to control, but when God uses it, it's to compel us back to himself, to purity, to holiness. Now, now, while they're confident in their assertions, it doesn't match God's counsel. Likewise, when God called them on their falsehoods, they have no shame about their deceptions. You'll notice back in verse 13, this is true for everybody. This isn't one segment of the population, it's all of them. So what are we supposed to do? If we're at this crossroads, how are we supposed to spot truth from fiction? I want to give you four things that you can use to spot falsehood and three things that you can use to stay on the right track. Let's start with how to spot false teachings and their teachers. The things that will take you away from God and his word. The things that will lead you into the ditch. Here's the first one. Animosity toward God and his people. Now, I've had people over the years that have told me about what a knucklehead I am and, and what a knucklehead church I have. And, and I'm going to tell you, I won't pin this on any of you, but they got the first part right. God knows this church deserves a better, smarter, wiser pastor than me. But I'm the one God has called here, so there we are. But if their whole reasoning for not coming to church is because of the pastor or the people in it, they've missed the point. I'm not here to please you. I'm here to be obedient to what God has called me to be. Likewise, animosity toward God and his people is endemic, it seems, these days. Oh, who is God to tell us what truth is? What makes him so right? Oh, friends, understand that animosity toward God and his people are uttered by false teachers and false teachings. If you have somebody who is angry at God, who is angry at his word, angry at his people, then they are assaulting the bride of Christ. 
Now, you can say whatever you want to about me, and you'll probably be right, but you start talking about my wife, we're going to have a problem. You understand what I'm saying? How much do you think Jesus feels that way, that way about his bride? Animosity toward God and his people reflects false teachers and false teaching. Here's the second one. Antip antipathy toward God's word. Well, we don't have to listen to God's word. The Bible has been corrupted. There are a lot of other books out there that are just as good. You know, anytime you want to have a longer conversation about this, I welcome it. Because I'll tell you, I've looked at those other books, part of my studies. They required it of me. And you know what I found? Not worth a dime. Not worth anything. The only thing that has any merit is the Bible that you hold in your hands now. So antipathy toward God's word should be a sign to you this is a false teacher and they're leading me down a false path. Here's the third thing. Anger at being corrected. When you find somebody that is teaching falsely and you approach them to tell them they're wrong and their immediate response is anger at you, then you can be relatively confident that they are a false teacher and that they're offering you false teaching. No. You see, the reality is being corrected is a natural and appropriate part of walking with God. I get it wrong, and often there are people in my life, and some of them in this room, that have come to me and said, hey, I think you got this wrong, Darren. I'm grateful for it. Can I tell you today, my friends, if you find somebody that's angry at being corrected, chances are good they're a false teacher and they're leading false teachings. The fourth one, an absence of humility. You might add to that an absence of shame. Absence of humility, meaning I'm so sure I'm right. I'm so confident in my own thinking. I'm so confident in, in my pa pa pathway, my plans, that I don't have to worry if I'm wrong. My hubris, my arrogance, my confidence is my defining quality. Can I tell you, friends, humility needs to be our defining quality. Our friends... Our friends that think otherwise paint themselves into a corner. Sort of like this man that, that bought a, a skill saw from me at Sears years ago when I was working there. I think I've shared this story before, but it bears repeating here. He bought the saw, and then about a week, maybe 10 days later, he came back. He had his receipt, and he had the saw, but he was with his wife this time, and he was on crutches. Huh. So he hobbles up to the counter where I'm standing. His wife drops it down. We want to bring this back. Satisfaction guaranteed is the, the motto for Sears. So here you go. We want, we're not satisfied. We want to bring it back. Okay. I said, no problem. Took their receipt and was entering. And then I saw a transformation take pl place. This wife looked at her husband and went into the power pose. Do you know what I'm talking about with a power pose? Well, are you going to tell him why you're on crutches? I knew he was in trouble. I had no idea what was going on. But I knew just by her posture that he was in trouble. And it wasn't his leg. Are you going to tell him? I didn't say a word. He said, okay, I'll tell him. I was cutting a two-by-four and I lost presence of mind. I leaned it against my leg and ran the skill saw into the side of my leg. That's why we're bringing it back. I'm not smart enough to keep it. <laughs> I can appreciate humility, honesty. I want you to realize something. What if he'd said, no, I know best if I want to cut my leg off with it. You might say, well, how stupid is he? My point exactly. Some of us are so confident that we're right that we're not willing to listen to even God himself. Humility calls us to listen. Now, that's false teachings 
That's false teachers. Now let's talk about how to find God's pathway. Now this is not an exhaustive list, neither was the other one. But I want to give you at least three things that you can say, here's three things I can do right now that will get me on the right path. Here's the first one. Embrace the truth of God's word and read it regularly. If the only time you're engaging in God's word is on Sunday when you're here, you're starving yourself. I'm pleading with you, let God's word be something that is in your hands and in your heart every day. It's never been easier. For those of us with smartphones, all you have to do is download the Bible app and it's right there. It'll go with you everywhere. What if we treated our Bibles the way we do our smartphones, looking at them 20, 30 times a day? How would our lives be different? Can I tell you today, my friends, embracing the truth of God's word means I have to know what's in it. You might say, well, I don't even know where to start. Hey, I got good news for you. We have two reading plans right outside in the Welcome Center and in the chapel for you. One's a seven-day plan featuring the I am statements of Jesus. What is it that Jesus says about himself? Grab one of those seven-day plans and start today. Maybe, just maybe, you're ready for something more. Spending a year in the Bible. There's a 365-day plan right outside there. Here's the second thing you can do to find God's pathway. Accept godly correction with humility, even if it hurts. If those who are correcting you love you and want what's good for you, then why wouldn't you? If they're godly leaders who are loving you enough to tell you the truth, then why wouldn't you accept it? And finally, embrace God's sovereignty as a stabilizing force. Did you feel the earthquake this week? We were actually here on Monday night when it struck. We were in one of our committee meetings, one of our monthly committee meetings, and we were sitting in there, and uh, the building shuddered a little bit, and uh, I was like, what's going on around here? And uh, it didn't shake a whole lot, just a little and just for a moment. And one of our committee members spoke up and said, I think we just had an earthquake. It caused me to think about the last one we had a couple of years ago. I was sitting on the couch with my son while we were playing video games. And when the earthquake struck, it was alarming. It was terrifying, in fact. And so what did I do? I grabbed my son with one arm, and you're going to love it, I grabbed the couch with the other. <laughs> Nothing wrong with grabbing my son, but grabbing the couch is probably not going to help. When you're shaken, you need something that's stable. I want to tell you, God's sovereignty is stable. It's not going to change. You can rest in it. You can secure yourself to it and say, this is what I know and this is what I can be sure of. Let's end with this. Two things to take home. Accepting God's correction acknowledges God's wisdom. If I know what God says and I'm willing to do what God says, then I, when I accept God's correction, then I get the chance to acknowledge his wisdom and agree with him that it is right, that it is true, that I can rest in it, and that it will stabilize my life. If you're one who lives in an uncertain time, and that's all of us, then understand this is a way to cut down on that. Finally, when at the crossroads, follow God's pathway and ignore false teachings. I have a sneaking suspicion that as soon as you enter, uh, exit this building, there's going to be false teachings waiting for you. You're going to have an opportunity to decide. My prayer is that you will lean into God's truth, that you'll take the example of Jeremiah, one who spoke boldly, one who trusted God, one who with humility embraced God, and you'll reject the direction of the people of his day who said, no, I know best. Now we're at a time of decision. What will you do with what you've heard? What will you do? Well, here's your options. One, you can do nothing. You can say, hey, that's a nice talk, Darren, but it's for somebody else, not me. That is an option. That is an option. Two, you can say, you know what, 
I need to give this some more thought before I choose to do something about it. That's an option as well. But the third option is the one I call, want to call you to. In our prayer time in just a moment, ask God where you need to repent. In our prayer time in a moment, ask God where you're choosing your own sovereignty over his. Where you need to humble yourself. Where you need to repent from and turn back to him. Where you've let false teachings and false teachers in and you need to follow God's pathway instead. Maybe you need to come to this altar and spend some time praying about that. Maybe not for yourself, maybe for someone else. Today is your day to respond. Let's pray together. I know, Lord Jesus, that your love is what compels you, compels you to seek us out. Today, right here and right now, just as we are, Lord, we come to you. My prayer is that we would respond to you. Forgive us for being swayed by these false teachers and these false teachings. Forgive us for trusting in our own sovereignty. Forgive us for a lack of repentance and a lack of shame. Forgive us for our arrogance and our pride. Help us now, Lord, to choose you. Because on the cross, you paid the penalty for all of that and more. I pray for those who need to respond to you today. Let them do so right here and right now. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So here's your chance to respond. If nobody moves, we're only going to sing one verse. So if you got something to say, you got something to do, here's your chance. Stand with me and sing as you come.